Now I'm going to turn it over to Jordan. Come up here, Jordan, just for a minute. He's tall, make me look short, which I am. <laughs> He's married to a wonderful lady named Tracy, which I have had the privilege of meeting. They've been here with all of their children, I believe. They have six children, yep. and um, I don't remember all their ages. And shame on this man. I'm putting this on tape tonight, but today's his wedding anniversary, and his wife is in Nashville, and he's here. But I think when he made this commitment, I think he thought for sure we'll be together up at Jack's. But they were in Serbia, northern Serbia, doing ministry there with uh, church pastors all through Serbia, northern Serbia, just a week ago, and then they had a vacation. So his wife, Tracy, felt it would be best to be home and get things settled there in Nashville again. But this man, he's been here, I think, at least two times, if not yeah, three. Third. third time. He got rained on the last time he was here. He preached half of his message here and the other half in the chapel. But I can tell you, um, we are very, very favored by Media Grate, by John Snyder, by Behold Your God, and by that team that continue to pour into this ministry. And I know I don't want to speak for John Snyder, but I have a hard time believing he wouldn't be here this summer, too, if we hadn't invited, if we would have invited him. Mm. We really feel a kinship with Media Grate. And I know that um, right now, um, Jordan is actually in the middle of writing a five-part series, uh, again, speaking to a tremendous uh, theme, which I'll let him address if he wants to. But I just want to welcome you tonight, my brother. Thank you, and brother. again, I want to wish you a happy anniversary. How many years again? 23. 23 years yeah. to Tracy. Yeah. Let's thank God for yeah. this man. Yeah. Lord, I thank you for Jordan Thomas. I pray, I know, Lord, he's not just preaching to preach tonight. I know that the message you have is important, it's vital, it's timely, and Lord, I ask that I would listen to it with all my heart. You'd speak to me, speak to men and women, husbands, wives, pastors, churches, and have your way, Lord, in a world where it seems very few want you to have your way. I pray for that tonight. Whatever that means, have your way tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let me rush to say thank you to those who led us uh, in song. And somebody got baptized yesterday? Yeah. Yeah, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So yeah. God's still saving people, huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Amen. That was fantastic. And to Jack, uh, thank you. It's always a joy for me to see Josh hear more of what the Lord's doing in Coatesville and uh, many of the churches here. There's several familiar faces. As Jack mentioned, this is my third time to have the privilege to be with you, and uh, that's, a, that's really, really a special joy. I uh, got to spend uh, time over the last few days with Jack, and as always, the fire for a fresh encounter with the risen Jesus is kindled in my spirit when I have the joy of being with this brother. So it's a privilege, and I am thankful to be here. Uh, my wife does give me her blessing, by the way, for me to be here. And uh, she's not in Nashville. She's three hours down the road in Memphis, where we live. 16 years ago, planted a, a church with uh, really, I'm not good at doing research and data and demographics and all that, but I did um, do enough research to ask where's the highest crime in one of the highest crime cities in the United States and the zip code that led all the zip codes in the Memphis area for many, many years is where we felt like the Lord was calling us. So I bring you greetings from a very broken part of our country that's full of a lot of beautiful people who need to know the glorious Savior. And I bring you greetings from your brothers and sisters in Memphis. And tonight I want to invite you to do something. Every one of your hearts is shaped by God like a container, if you could imagine and envision it that way. And I want to invite you to do something with the container of your heart. To dip your heart, to dip your life into the fullness of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why I've come. It's a summary of the message. Perhaps you're somebody who is walking in close fellowship with the Lord what the New Testament describes as walking in the Spirit, life in the Spirit, maybe that's you. Maybe you've had a fresh encounter 
with the Lord Jesus today. You've dipped yourself into the bounty of Christ. You're overflowing with his all-sufficiency. Or maybe you're a Christian like, like many, truly in Christ. But if you were honest, you know you've grown cold. Your heart is stagnant. You can remember what it used to be like when you walked in close, intimate fellowship with the Savior, or maybe you're not yet a Christian. Well, we've got a testimony sitting right here that God's still saving people, and uh, there's room for you. Maybe you're not yet a Christian, and as a result of not yet encountering the fullness of Christ, I know from my own experience what it's like to not have Jesus and live in intimate fellowship with him. If you don't have a vital love relationship with Jesus, then I already know. Even though I don't know your names, I don't know your life story, I know that you're going to be very tempted and probably succumb to look to relationships and money and notoriety and on and on and on to find something that'll satisfy your inmost longing. Here's the good news of the gospel. The good news of the gospel. The gospel is what God has done in Christ to bring you into an everlasting relationship with himself. What God has done, not what we have done. The gospel is the good news of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. What God has done in Christ to bring us into a relationship with himself. Here's the good news. Those who believe the gospel message will never cease to be satisfied because... God gives us himself. The reason the gospel is good news is especially because God himself is the fountain of satisfaction that our hearts so desperately crave. That's why the Bible repeatedly says things like John chapter 1, speaking only of Christians, of the fullness of Christ we have all received grace on top of grace. Repeatedly, the scriptures speak of the fullness of God in Christ to his people like a, a waterfall of a privilege that belongs exclusively to those who walk in fellowship with Jesus and know him as their Lord. The Bible's replete with this image. Uh, the book of Ephesians talks about God lavishing his grace on us. It's a picture of a waterfall that just never stops. Niagara Falls times a thousand. God's grace coming toward those who know him in his son. So dear ones, I've come tonight once again with a burden from the Lord to encourage you to take your heart and to plunge your heart deep into the heart of Jesus again and to find your heart full and satisfied in what the scripture speaks of as the incomprehensible love of Jesus, Ephesians 3. The unfathomable greatness of Jesus, Ephesians 3. So instead of trying to find our soul's rest somewhere else, would you turn again with me for just a moment and look deep into the heart of Jesus? We'll be in Ephesians chapter 3. We'll take one verse as our primary focus. Sometimes out here in this beautiful camp setting, I know maybe not everybody has a Bible in their lap or a gadget in their hand where they can look at the Bible. So one verse, we'll draw a little bit from the verses around it, but I want you to hear this theme this evening, not from me, but from the word of the living God, Ephesians chapter four, verse 13. I'm gonna read from the New American Standard Translation, and I want you to think about the incomprehensible fullness of Jesus, the unimaginably great fullness of Jesus that God wants you to enjoy. Ephesians 4, verse 13, hear the word of the Lord. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Join me at the throne of grace as we ask for God's help one more time, then we're gonna consider this verse together. Father in Christ, you've made our souls capable of containing the uncontainable, of, of knowing the unknowable. This is how you describe what fellowship with you is like, that you enable us to share with our blessed Lord Jesus, 
in delighting our souls in you, the fountain of joy. That's the way you talk about yourself in Psalm 43 and Jeremiah 2, that you are a river of endless delight. So here's what we ask, God, boldly, confidently, in Jesus' name, we ask that you would open our eyes to see and to embrace what you reveal to us in Ephesians 4.13 about the fullness of Jesus. Give us yourself, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I want to say something that I think all Christians would agree with, but we live in a day where it's hard to get agreement even among Christians, all right? This is not meant to be controversial. This is meant to be introductory and something that I want to assume that we can all agree with, but let's just state it explicitly so that we don't assume that we're all on the same page. Here's the assumption. The New Testament is crystal clear that the greatest blessing God could possibly give to anyone is his glorious son. That's the blessing, okay? So if we can agree there, then I dare you to pray that God would allow you now, not tomorrow, now to enjoy Ephesians 4.13 the way God talks about it. The fact that Jesus is the greatest possible blessing God could give us is not something that God has been silent about. In Ephesians 1, there's a picture of God stretching his infinite arms to the far reaches of heaven to grab every possible blessing that he could reach to give them to you. And the way that verse says he gives them to you is he gives you Christ. Every blessing in the heavenly places is yours in Christ. In Colossians, we're told that the great gift of the gospel is given to us so that, verse 18 of Colossians 1, we get the preeminence, the first place of Jesus in our heart. Philippians 1, to live as Christ, to die as gain. Okay, so many verses that would say that Jesus is the greatest possible gift that God could give us. Now, that's the reason that heaven will never cease to thrill your soul. For endless eternities, when this little life, vapor of a life is over, for endless eternities, you and I will be tracking down with sinless vigor, we will be tracking down all the riches of the glory of the blessings that are ours in Christ. Heaven is forever because you will never get to the edges, you will never get to the bottom of the fullness of all that God is for you in Christ. You will be infinitely exhilarated and you will never exhaust all the privileges that are yours in him. Ephesians 4.13 is a verse like that. So before we dive into it, let's just make sure everybody gets the same page of, of what the book of Ephesians is about. Chapter 1, here's the good news. Before you were ever born, God the Father planned your salvation. In time, God the Son accomplished your salvation. And the Holy Spirit applies your salvation. Father, Son, and Spirit conspiring together, the one true God, to redeem you. That's what Ephesians 1 is about. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul elaborates on what it's like to become a Christian. Now, we don't tend to think of ourselves the way the Bible describes us, but guess what? God is true, even if it means every man's a liar. That's what Scripture says. So Ephesians chapter 2 says, when you're born, you're born with a big problem. And your problem is called being dead. Dead in your trespasses and sins, incapable of doing anything to commend yourself to God. In fact, anything you would try to do to commend yourself to God, to make him like you more, to make him want to save you, only worsens your damnable predicament because Ephesians 2 says, you love another Lord. That is the prince of the power of the air. That's Satan. That's the enemy of your soul. However, Ephesians 2 says... God is so abundantly rich in mercy. He's so lavish. He's so ridiculously good that he hunted you down in his mercy. He chased you with mercy. He came and stalked you with love, and he made you alive together with his son. And at the end of the day, those who are alive together with Christ, Ephesians 2 says, just sing a song of grace it's by grace we're saved through faith. It's a gift. It's not of ourselves. Nobody gets to boast. God gets all the glory. That's Ephesians 2. So in chapter 1, the Trinity planned your salvation. Chapter 2, that's what salvation looks like. Chapter 3, Paul starts saying, now, now here's my one job. Here's the one thing God called me to do. 
to tell people to comprehend something that your mind cannot contain, to fathom something that's unfathomable, namely the riches of Christ. And because your mind and heart are just too small for an infinitely big God, Paul ends Ephesians chapter 3 by praying that God would drive these truths deep into your heart. Now, I don't know if you would be offended because I know that many of you have walked with the Lord longer than I've been alive because Jack's told me some of your stories and some of you are freshly in Christ and that's such a thrill to my heart. I don't know if you would be offended if I came all the way from Memphis and stood up here on this platform on this beautiful evening and said, you know what I'm praying for you? I'm praying that Jesus would dwell in your heart. Now, I don't know if you'd be offended thinking, who does this guy think he is? He's already in my heart. Do you know how Paul prays for the Ephesians? In Ephesians chapter 3, I pray that Christ will dwell in your heart through faith so that you will be filled to all the fullness of God. He's not talking to not yet Christians. He's talking to already Christians. We forget that we've been given a key to the treasury of God's bounty in Christ. Now we're in chapter 4. We all on the same page? This is Memphis talk. I double dog dare you to look at verse 13. There's two things I want to say about it. And I'm a preacher like a lot of them, so I've got points under my two points, but you just save those for a minute. Verse 13, the first thing I want you to see is that your relationship with Jesus is very, very, very personal, but it is never, never, never private. I got to say it again, because we live in a very hyper-individualistic West. Brother Jack just mentioned two weeks ago, I was in northern Serbia. I was actually privileged to speak to missionaries who are serving in 16 countries around the Black Sea. One of those countries is Ukraine. Those missionaries came from those 16 countries to a little hideaway place in northern Serbia. And I had the honor and privilege of trying to fill them up with Jesus so they can go back to their places and serve for his name. And, and they don't come from a place where they're, where they're serving that's like our place. They're more relational and communal and kind of everybody helps everybody. But over here, there's a lot of this talk about me and Jesus. I want to say our point again, then I want to show it to you in the verse. Your relationship with Jesus is very personal. It must be personal. You must have a love relationship with the King of glory. Very personal. Never private. Look at verse 13. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith until we all attain to a knowing of the Son of God, until we all attain maturity in Him, until we all are filled up with the full measure of the stature that belongs to Jesus. What I'm trying to say is that I love you enough to tell you that not one syllable of that verse was written to an individual Christian. It's written to the church at Ephesus. The whole congregation is supposed to take that verse and put it into practice. Ephesians chapter 4 reiterates a dominating truth of the New Testament. This is about on every page of the Bible that I've ever read. A vibrant, growing, maturing, faithful relationship with Christ is available only on God's terms. All he invites you to is to lay down everything at the foot of the cross. And if you want a broker with God, you can't have him. But if you will surrender yourself to the greatness and glory of heaven's favorite who climbed on a cross to buy you, to pay for you, to redeem you, to forgive you, to reconcile you to God, if you will humble yourself and throw yourself at the feet of the King of glory, and you will do so in concert with others who are also 
throwing themselves at the feet of the king of glory, and you will immerse your life, embed your life into, like Ephesus, a local church where together you're striving with one heart. He said unity. One heart, one mind, one spirit. After the face of your Lord, then you'll know the fullness of Christ. God has established a rule in his kingdom. You can't break it. You may not know it. You may have never heard it. And I promise you, you've lived by it. Because when he sets the rule, it can't be bent. It can't be broken. And here's the rule. There's one way to grow in Christ. Give yourself away. You keep pouring out, he keeps pouring in. You become a sponge, you get stagnant, he stops pouring. But when you get so infected with the heart of Jesus for his people, then you don't want to be content for you and him to have a private relationship. You're interested in everybody else growing in him as well. That's what verse 13 is all about. So, until we all attain to the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, maturity, full of the measure of the stature that belongs to Christ, God has been pleased to reserve the fullness of Christ for those who walk in unity with his people, I believe, in a local church. That's why I'm so thrilled to be at an event like this. Jack's already mentioned there's so many churches represented. Now, just imagine if Jesus took 11 men and turn the world upside down, and go look at the history of their life in the book of Acts and the pages of the New Testament. Every last one of them gave their life to establishing and strengthening local churches. All of them. That's what they did with the Great Commission. Just imagine if 11 men turned the whole world upside down, what could God do with a group like this? who dip the thimble of their life into the ocean of Christ's fullness and go back to our churches and try to help other people drink from that fountain. What could God do? So, I told you I have sub-points. Point number one is your relationship with Jesus is very personal, but it's never private. The second aspect of that, that I want to look at before our last point is when the fullness of the very full Christ starts pouring out on a church, something very specific happens, and it's found in this passage right before our verse. So in the first seven verses of Ephesians 4, we pursue unity. Actually, we diligently seek to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We're not willing to let little petty factions get between brothers and sisters who are bought by the blood of the king. We fight for unity because it's something Jesus said will be a testimony to the world that we belong to him. And it'll actually compel them to want to get in on that grace. So we don't let divisions and factions and stupid, petty things and preferential secondary convictions get in the way of the reality that the second person of the Trinity dismounted the throne of heaven and stepped into this sin-torn world and lived the life that you were supposed to live and died the death that you were supposed to die and God vindicated his sacrifice and stamped to the universe that he's accepted as a redeemer, even for sinners like you and me, by raising him from the dead. No, we're not going to let stupid stuff get between our unity, okay? That's verses 1 to 7. But verses 8 to 12 tell us when we walk with this Jesus, I said there's a very particular result. You see, when Jesus got up from the dead, he soon ascended to his rightful place as heaven's king. While you're sitting in your lawn chair, he's sitting on heaven's throne. And from his throne, this passage tells us what he's doing. Among other things, we find from other passages like interceding for his people. In this passage, we find he's giving gifts to his churches. He's giving pastors and teachers and evangelists. He's giving people. 
who love Jesus with all their heart to all of his churches for a reason. Do you see the reason in verse 12? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ. Now, I know up here in Philly, they do school better than we do down in Memphis. So I got to ask you a question about this verse. You mean to tell me that when Jesus sat on the throne of heaven and started giving gifts to his church, this verse says the reason he did it is so that his churches would be built up in him? Now, now down in Memphis, again, it, it takes us a little while to put two and two together, but does that not say that Jesus is the most Jesus-centered person in your church? And if Jesus is filling your church up, one of the great evidences that it's Jesus doing the filling is that more people, verse 12, will be built up in Jesus? You have to get your eyes off of you and put your eyes on him. So, point number one, your relationship with Jesus is very personal, but it is never private. You got to care about all the other people that your Jesus is saving. Number two, <clears throat> Paul knows we're a bunch of relativists. He knows we're going to move the goalpost all the time. Like, I know that it's the end of July, and half of you people made a New Year's resolution that you were going to eat right and exercise back in January. And about half of those people got the same food in their refrigerator and hadn't been to the gym one time, right? So I'm going to do it tomorrow, right? We keep moving the goalpost. We keep changing the standard, and Paul knows we're a bunch of relativists. So here's our second and final point. Local churches are designed by God to maximize every believer's enjoyment of the incalculable fullness of Jesus. And that's a lot of words. When I say Paul knows we're relativists, he knows that we're going to change how full of Jesus we really need to be to be walking in fellowship with Jesus. The proverbial live life however I want to, go to his heaven when I die. No, no. Verse 13 teaches, I'm going to say it again, that God has designed the churches to be a maximum enjoyment of the fullness of Jesus incubator. He wants you more full of Jesus than you want to be full of Jesus. That's what I'm seeing in verse 13, and I want you to try to see it with me. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. The word for mature is literally perfect. It's the Greek word teleos. It's used in verses like Colossians 1, where it says we proclaim Christ, that we may present every man complete. Teleos in Christ, or Hebrews 5, you've been a Christian a long time. Hebrews chapter 5 says there's a big problem if you're still drinking spiritual milk. Because Hebrews 5.14 says, by this time, you should be teleos. You should be mature. You should be grown up in the faith. You should be more full on Jesus than you are. See, we just keep moving the goalposts, so we think a little bit of maturity is okay. Matthew 5.48 says you actually have to be as teleos as God if you want to get to heaven. That's actually very bad news. R.C. Sproul said the worst news in the universe is that God is holy. It's the worst news in the universe. Maybe tied for first is Matthew 5, 48. Right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, you have to be as perfect as his heavenly father if you want to be in his kingdom. It's this word teleos. That's the same word in verse 13. A teleos person, a mature person, full humanity as it was meant to be. You know, it's a beautiful night, and the sun's not in the height of the sky above us, and we thank God for that. But in just a little while, and maybe some of you can see it already, there's going to be another big ball in the sky. 
and it's going to look like it's got some light in it, but it doesn't. The moon has no light. It's made just to reflect the light of the sun. And you're supposed to be like that with Christ, reflecting his glory, showing his greatness. That's what Christian maturity is all about. It's about him and not you. So as we conclude our second and final look at verse 13, here's my sub point. Knowing and enjoying the fullness of Jesus is a community project. You don't get to give up on the church because somebody did something someday way back there. You don't get to give up on the church because Acts chapter 20 says, and I quote, he bought her with his own blood. You can't forsake her. The ultimate goal of Christ for his churches is that we know and enjoy Christ until we all attain, until we all are unified, until we all know the Son of God, until we're all mature, until we all have the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Friends, this is just basic biblical Christianity. It's not super spirituality. It's not like Navy SEAL, elite warrior Christian. It's just basic Bible Jesus following. We've so lost our way in the contemporary church, especially in the West, that for somebody to come and stand and say something like this, you should devote your entire life to apprehending the fullness of your Savior in community with redeemed people called a church. The reason that sounds ridiculous is because a lot of people would say, if we're honest, it's boring it's actually unsatisfying. And one thing I'm trying to say over and over and over again tonight is what Isaac Ambrose said in the early 1600s when the gospel came running through his soul like a freight train. And he said, there is nothing more satisfying. There is nothing more soul contenting. There is nothing more ravishing. There is nothing more soul nourishing than enjoying the fullness of Christ. Nothing. Nothing. You know you've tried a lot of things. And you know you could stand here in my place and say, everything but Jesus eventually left you more empty than when you came. But you know, I've never heard of a person who said, I really regret following the true Jesus. I, I really regret dipping my life into the ocean of his fullness. Now, I know there's a lot of people who are walking away from the faith, but the Bible already has something to say to us about them. They never had it to begin with. They went out from us because they were not of us. Friends, God wants you to see something that Satan is working very, very hard for you not to see. 2 Corinthians says... The one thing that Satan does not want you to see, he doesn't care how busy you are for God. Satan, 2 Corinthians 4.2, does not want you to see the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. Guess what God wants you to see? You remember when the queen of Sheba came to see Solomon? She was a queen, by the way, in North Africa. She had a lot of money and riches and wealth. But she heard that Solomon's kingdom was greater. And when she got there, 2 Chronicles 9, 4 says, her breath was taken away. Her jaw dropped. One translation says she was speechless. You know what it's like for your heart to skip a beat? That's what she was like in front of Solomon. Guess what Jesus said about that passage? Something greater than Solomon is here. Your jaw should drop. Your heart should skip a beat. Your breath should be taken away. But we're unimpressed with him. I'm here to tell you, Revelation chapter 4 says, while you're sitting there right now, the angels of heaven are in a symphony crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty. The 24 elders are falling down right now saying, worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. This is actually good news. He does not need your worship. He's already got it. So when he invites you, 
to come and drink from the waters of his fullness. He's not doing it so that you can give him something that he doesn't already possess. He's inviting you to join him in delighting in what he's been delighting in from eternity, namely God. God. You get God. So here's our last sub point. Devote your life to pursuing the prize God has set before you in accord with Christ's church. Again, it's a lot of words, but it's right there in the verse. Until we all attain to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Set your life's gaze on the final three words. Fullness of Christ. And set your gaze with God on helping others fix their gaze on the ocean of the fullness of Christ. The Apostle Paul knows, he said earlier, we're going to change the goalposts. So here's the way all of Ephesians chapter 4 works. It's a series of questions, and Paul gives the answer. It's a series of questions, Paul gives the answer. A question in Ephesians 4 in the early part would sound like this. How much unity, Paul? His answer would be, the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. How much do I have to know the Son of God? How intimately acquainted with God's Son do I need to be, Paul? What's all this Philippians 3, counting everything else as lost so that I may know Christ? What's all that about, Paul? How, how much do I need to know Jesus? the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ? How mature in him do I need to be? How, how, when can I stop striving for, for more of his fullness in my life? How, how mature, Paul, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ? One translation said, puts it this way, measured by Christ's fullness. The King James puts it this way, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. You've got to be as full of Jesus as Jesus is full of Jesus. And you've got to help other people drink from the fountain of his fullness. You'll actually never be satisfied unless you live your life that way. God's actually inviting you to joy. He's inviting you to bliss. And if none of this sounds really appealing to you, then I actually have bad news. This is all heaven's going to be. Eternity is going to be one long John 17, 24, beholding the glory of Christ. Revelation chapter 21 the sun's not going to shine in heaven. There won't even be a sun. Jesus is going to flick it away. It's going to be gone. But there'll never be a nighttime in heaven because the lamp of heaven is who? The lamb. The lamb. Why a lamb? John 1, 29, that's why a lamb. The lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world forever. You're going to see the light of the lamb who took your sin away so you could be there. This is the whole point. David Dixon, Charles Spurgeon's favorite commentator, said Jesus Christ is the sum total of saving knowledge. He's everything. If you don't want to be full of Christ from bottom to top, then you won't want heaven either. This is why Paul prays for the Ephesian church in chapter 3 of Ephesians. That you, plural, all of you, y'all, that's the way we say it in my territory, would be filled to all the fullness of God. Here's our application. Verse 13, I believe, this may expose my biblical ignorance, I believe verse 13 is the single most comprehensive one-verse statement of God's purpose 
for gospel ministry. Now, what does it look like? The, the remaining verses right after verse 13 tell us what this looks like. In verses 17 to 19, you have to repent from godless, Christless living. You don't turn over a new leaf and promise God you're going to do better. You repent. You tell God you're sorry. You ask for forgiveness. You ask him to empower you. You don't promise him what you're going to do for him. You turn away, verse 17, from what lost people live their life on. And... You, verse 17, try to get rooted and grounded in the love of God for you in Jesus. Verse 18, unlike lost people, you ask God to make your heart tender to Jesus and your mind more immersed in the truth of his word. Verse 19, unlike lost people, you're careful with your body. You don't use it in animalistic sensuality. In, in verse 19, it's actually gross. They're just sexually deviant with anything that moves. It sounds like our generation but verse 19 says, you carry your body in purity and in holiness. And what it like, looks like to be satisfied in Christ. You don't have to go seek satisfaction in some of these empty, broken cisterns that are only going to destroy you. So you repent from godless, Christless living. Verse 15 would tell us you dive deep into Jesus. Verse 16 would say you grow up into Jesus. In verse 15, you go into his word. You let the roots of your life go down into the truth of scripture so that you can know your savior more. The whole book is written by one person. His name is God, and it has one main subject. His name is Jesus. And if you want to know him, he wrote you a love letter. And then in verses 20 to 24, this is what it looks like to dip the thimble of your life into the ocean of Christ's fullness. You give God no rest until Christ is formed in you. Christ is the pattern, verse 20, for your whole life. So in verse 21, you listen to him, you learn from him, you take all the resources from your life from the repository of his fullness. I, I, verse 20, I had to reread it like 10 times in preparation for this message because it doesn't say it the way I expected it. The word about is not in the verse. It doesn't say you didn't learn about Christ in this way. It says you didn't learn Christ in this way. Christ. He's not somebody you know about. He's yours. You love him. You live in fellowship with him. You pray like he got up from the dead. You talk with him. You pursue him. And look, if evangelism is a word that seems scary to you and hard for you because you chicken out like I do every time you're about to share the gospel with somebody and you ask God to forgive you and tell them you're sorry and help you next time. Let me just remind you, remind me, everybody talks about what they love. Everybody's an evangelist. You tell people about your favorite food and your favorite sports team and entertainment and fashion and everybody's evangelizing all the time because everybody talks about what they love. And instead of giving you a checklist, go tell more people about Jesus, let me give you a very joy-filled assignment. Dip the container of your life into the fullness of Christ. I promise you, Acts chapter 4 will happen to you. Whether it's right in your sight to stop speaking about this man that got it from the dead, you be the judge. We cannot stop talking about what we have seen and heard. Let Jesus run away to heaven with your heart. And he'll open your mouth. You'll start telling people about this infinitely glorious Savior that's too big for you. So you want others to get in on his fullness too. Last little comment, one to a Christian, one to a not yet Christian. To the Christian, just want to admonish and appeal to you, don't do Satan's work for him. One of his names in scripture is accuser of the brethren. And I just keep finding, in fact, they're in no short order. They're not hard to find. People have a lot of shrapnel in them spiritually 
and they just keep vomiting it out against the church. Don't do Satan's work for him. There's somebody who accuses the brethren. He doesn't need any more help. And God forbid that people for whom Jesus died talk about his bride in a way that Hebrews says is like a cancer to her, a root of bitterness that springs up and defiles everybody. Don't do Satan's work for him. Love the bride of Christ. So if you murmur and complain and it's easy for you to point out all the fault lines in the bride of Christ and never provide any solutions for her weaknesses. Or if you find it easy to talk about all of her weaknesses and failures, then you're in a battle you can't win because your enemy is actually God. You're, you're warring against God. And so if that's you, I just declare to you that God demands for you to repent. Tell him, you left the treasure troves of the fullness of Jesus unexplored. Your heart got wrapped up in the bitterness because you left Jesus unenjoyed. And instead of going after him, you, you treated him as if he's unwanted. And so just ask God to renew within you the joy of his salvation and to unite your heart in concert with his people so that you and they and they and you may help one another pursue his fullness together. Agree with God that he's the one who called you into his family and called you to pursue unity with his family in the faith until you're all full of the measure of the stature which belongs to Christ. Just return to Jesus. You don't have to clean yourself up. He's good at his job. There is a Savior. You are not him. Just go to Jesus. He'll do the work. Lastly, to those who are not yet Christians, notice I put it that way, not because of power of positive thinking, but I prayed for you. And I believe God would love to reach his mighty hand down out of heaven into your little heart right now. Uh, he may already be doing that. John 6, Jesus said, nobody can come to him unless the Father who sent him draws them. And I can't see your heart, but I would like to believe that God Almighty is taking somebody's heart and he's just pulling you to Christ right now. So I want to ask you to do something. You don't have to identify yourself. You don't have to show yourself. You don't have to say anything. I want you to see some Christians for just a moment. So if you're not yet a Christian, I want you to watch something. If there are Christians here, who would love to help somebody interested in Jesus come to the fountain of the fullness of Christ, but you're not already discipling another Christian. You're not already engaged in helping another Christian grow actively, but you would be willing to do it. If you would be willing to help somebody grasp the message of the gospel and know how they can tap into Christ's fullness with you in your local church. You would be willing to walk with them, probably even stand in the water with them if they give their life to Christ as they're getting baptized. You would be willing to go to the Lord's table with them and help them take this symbol of what it looks like to belong to the king of the universe and live in fellowship with his people. If you, Christian, would be willing to help somebody who's not yet one, know the fullness of Jesus, and you're not already actively doing that, I'm going to ask you to just put your hand up. You would help somebody know Christ. There's a ton of people who would be willing to do that. Now, if you're not yet a Christian, go find them. Go walk with them. Open this book together. Seek the Lord's face together. There is no excuse. You can follow Christ, and we'll help you do it. <laughs> there is no excuse. So after this service, you find one of these people, and if I don't see you again on this side of eternity, I'm really looking forward to seeing what you're going to look like in glory when you are as full of the measure of the stature of Christ as he is. I can't wait to see it with my own eyes. Father, thank you for these precious people. I pray that the fullness of Christ would flood these plains and prairies 
all these little hamlets and villages and cities and towns. I pray from Coatesville to the far off reaches of wherever else anybody here is from. We ask, Lord, that Jesus, Jesus, Jesus would be filling up the lives of his people and it would be evident in the fact that your people are helping your people drink from the fullness of Jesus and your churches are being built up in the faith. People are being sent out to do the same thing all over the world. Do it for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to hang up here tonight a little bit. Be happy to meet anybody, pray with anybody. Absolutely. God, speak into your heart. Don't leave. One thing that was not said tonight, and I know it's just filling this man's heart, at least I heard him say it this week. If what he preached tonight isn't happening in us, individually, personally, and not privately, together, if it's not happening, our gospel is hid, and it's hidden to them who are lost. That's how high the stakes are. There are people that will never know because we never shined a light that brought glory to Christ. May God help us. Lord, tonight, thank you for family, friends, loved ones, benefactors, kind, dear members of the body of Christ for bringing us together. We just pray your anointing upon Jordan as he continues to study and write this week. Thank you for the choir songs. Now dismiss us with your grace and blessing. In Jesus' name, amen.